People tell us every week that our information has helped save their life. If you agree that this is helpful information, please like, share, and most of all, subscribe. Because nothing makes a channel like subscriptions. Aspirin for secondary prevention. The first article we're going to talk about was in The Lancet in 2009 talks about primary prevention treating patients without disease and secondary prevention treating patients with established cardiovascular disease. And as you'll find, that key is the key to most of the disruption errors that are going on today. People have seen these articles in Time Magazine, the New York Times, you name it. U.S. Preventive Services Task Force no longer requires or recommends baby aspirin for cardiovascular disease prevention. And people read that, they see the headline, and they quit taking it. They still don't cover the difference between primary and secondary. Now, this was a meta-analysis in The Lancet. It included 16 trials. Aspirin showed a significant reduction. Now, if you read that, it sounds like the numbers internally don't work. Reduction of 8.2% of events when used for secondary strokes, heart attack. The bottom line is you've got a denominator problem, which I won't go into. One thing I will do is give you the p-value. Do you remember what p-values are? I'm going to assume that you don't. It's a probability value. A probability that these results would have occurred in a random fashion. And you can do that using biased statistics. We won't get into that, but I will give you the p-value. It was 0. 0.0001. And unless I'm mistaken, that's 1 in 10,000 probability that these results would have happened at random. In other words, AB aspirin showed a very strong impact in these studies in terms of decreasing cardiovascular events, heart attacks, and strokes. Now, the results of three other major randomized clinical trials showed little to no benefit in aspirin with primary prevention. So again, it works great for secondary prevention, doesn't work very well for primary. In other words, if it's just your age and you have no plaque, no cardiovascular disease, you shouldn't be taking it. So there was a slight decrease in aspirin use. If you look at the trends, this was in the American Journal of Preventive Cardiology in 2021 in the US. There was a slight decrease in aspirin use. There was an increase of use in primary prevention without additional benefit. Aspirin is used for secondary prevention in about 70% of the cases. So in other words, about a third of us that need baby aspirin for secondary cardiovascular disease prevention are just not taking it. There's inconsistent use for secondary prevention in women. It's inexpensive and is easy to access. We'll talk about access in a minute. Bart Robinson mentioned in one of our recent videos, Doc, you just can't find baby aspirin without the enteric coating. And I went back and looked because I have an atrial fib patient or paroxysmal atrial fib. I haven't had an, an episode that I can feel in, what, five years now? But I still take a NOAC, Rivaroxaban or Xarelta, which is what you should take because aspirin is not the correct blood thinner. It doesn't decrease the increased risk of stroke for people with atrial fib. Again, I went down a long, made that a short bunny hole, a long one. But I made that bunny hole because... I wanted to make the point, I have not shot for baby aspirin in quite a few years. Once Bart on the channel raised that issue, I started looking and I could not find non-enteric coated baby aspirin either. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Aspirin in primary prevention might decrease your calcium score. However, risk factors should be the major focus. This was in circulation 2014. The authors considered other risk factors. For them, LDL, which is not a significant risk factor in my mind, uh, nearly as much as some of the other things like A1C, exercise, diet, smoking, blood pressure. So aspirin use should be personalized. Now, what's the best dose? 81 milligrams or baby aspirin versus 325 milligrams. This goes back to the New England Journal 2021. There's no differences in cardiovascular outcomes between the doses. There were no significant differences on bleeding rates, and most people took 81 milligrams. The lower dose is probably the better recommendation. A lot of that's built on the assumption that there's a thing called COX-2 inhibition. 
which I won't get into. So I have a few patients that take regular aspirin and my recommendation is go back to the 81, but as you can see, it's not a big issue. Now, back to these comments about enteric coated versus non-enteric coated. The enteric coated doesn't provide the expected protection. This is an article from the, the International Journal of uh, General Medicine and the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, JAG, the first in 2021 and the second in 2017. Enteric coats, as I've mentioned multiple times before, they don't provide the protection that you think they're going to provide. It does, however, decrease bioavailability, affecting the absorption. So why is all baby aspirin available with enteric coating? Because people assume that's the way to do it. Unfortunately, the marketing decisions not made by medical scientists, and they're not made for medical scientists. They're made for people, most of whom don't understand this. The coating is appropriate for patients with severe GI symptoms and problems. Now, what do you do? Take chewable aspirin. It provides the most reliable antiplatelet effect. So there you go, Bart. Thank you again for sharing that concern. Now, here's another issue. Is it better to take aspirin at night? This was an article in Hypertension Magazine in 2015 from the Netherlands. Aspirin at bedtime did not reduce blood pressure compared with intake on awakening. Platelet reactivity during morning hours was reduced with the bedtime intake. Bottom line is they really didn't answer that question. And here's my suspicion. I don't think they will. Some people need to take it in the morning because they do better taking it with food. And even if it's the chewable kind. And from my perspective, that's fine. At this point, the evidence is inconclusive on time of day. And I suspect it will remain. So there you go. Aspirin and cardiovascular prevention.